So let's jump into it. Um, I was recently at ASCO in Chicago and I was jumping around and there was, there was a uh, tailored therapy for this. There was um, liquid biopsy for that. There was um, immunotherapy for the other thing. There was just all kinds of stuff. And actually all of it's good and all of it's important, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time doing what the French call stepping back to jump better. Because I think, you know, sometimes with all this technology and all these new tools, we lose perspective of what we're here for. So the prism for this discussion is this is the cover of the original Surgeon General's report on tobacco and health. And this was published in uh, 1963. Uh, it was a two year process doing all this stuff. And I wanna go through that just a bit because I think it helps us with some of the opportunities or challenges we face right now in screening. Okay, so Luther Terry was a quiet little guy from Arkansas who got tapped on the shoulder by John F. Kennedy and said, hey, we got this problem with tobacco. The American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, and what's now known as the American Lung Association sent me a letter because we have all this lung cancer and we have all this tobacco related disease. This is 1960, two decades after the war when cigarette smoking in the United States went from on average one pack a year to you know, two orders of magnitude higher than that. And the numbers in terms of cardiovascular deaths and lung cancer were just blowing through the roof and people were concerned. So the uh, gorilla in the room was tobacco is geographically very important in certain parts of the United States that were essential to the election of John F. Kennedy. So he was very concerned about this hot potato. And that's when he started thinking about Luther Terry, who then was Surgeon General with no job description and no power. And he says, I want you to take care of this unprecedented health threat and report back to me. So Luther Terry was actually a very thoughtful guy. And he said, listen, I'm gonna get, no one's gonna listen to me. I'm only the Surgeon General, no one even knows what that is. I'm gonna get a hundred of the smartest people in the country and we're gonna analyze this and we're gonna figure out what's going on. So, um, so here's a picture of the presentation of their findings. This was in the State Department Auditorium on a Saturday morning. Once they started their presentations, all the doors to the auditorium were locked because they were terrified with the announcement of these findings that the stock market might crash because tobacco was gonna be a banned product and everybody was gonna go crazy. So there was incredible drama around this. And yet these guys were serious. These are the principal findings in that Surgeon General's report. And they used a very careful analysis. They looked at thousands of, 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 of publications. They boiled down to seven major studies, which had sufficient follow-up maturity that they could make conclusions about mortality risk. And those seven studies were, were analyzed in a very critical fashion led by William Cochran. Cochran's a name you might've heard. And this was the first example of a meta-analysis. And that meta-analysis was looking for what was tobacco related that increased risk of dying. And so in this analysis, they wound up finding that there was a mortality ratio of 1.7 for cardiovascular disease. However, this relatively modest rise in risk accounted for 45% of the excess deaths. <clears throat> and then in the number two position, with a, uh, a, a risk ratio of over 10 was lung cancer, but it only accounted for 15% of the deaths. So they went through and they basically concluded that there was tobacco-induced 
related diseases. They're very concerned about association versus causality. And we're not gonna get into that, but they basically concluded that these tobacco related disease, a relatively compact number of these, cancers and vascular diseases and a few other things, accounted for 85% of the excess mortality related to tobacco use which is kind of interesting because this had never been established before. They didn't know how many diseases it caused. Now it turned out that their findings were fairly robust. And the backstory on this is outlined in a very interesting way in this book that many of you may have read. And I might encourage you to go back and read the stuff about the uh, Surgeon General's activity because there was, all kinds of precedents established in terms of how they approach this problem. And we'll talk about some of them. And that was 1963, 64 is when it came out uh, after John Kennedy's death. And some years later in the early 2000s, there was kind of a follow-up event and that was the Justice Department's investigation into litigation with Philip Morris around their marketing activities and the tobacco industry in general's marketing activities. And so there was a book written by the lead litigator for the Justice Department, Sharon Eubanks, in which she quotes Gladys Kessler, who was the, uh, the judge. And Judge Kessler in her 1700 page diatribe about the tobacco industry said that the tobacco industry marketed and sold the lethal product with zeal and with a single-minded focus on their financial success without regard to the human tragedy of social costs that their success extracted. Now for a federal judge to say that's kind of a big deal. That's, that's kind of, it's kind of out of bounds language. And uh, Sharon Eubanks who was a remarkable individual went on to, uh, in the course of her book to say other things, which are on the next slide. And this is from her testimony to the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. This is about the tobacco litigation, okay? And um, um, Lori Fenton smiling there, Sheila has just left the room, but they filed an, an amicus brief in 2006 as part of this, of this activity. So we kind of, saw this happen in real time. And in August of 2006, Judge Chess Kessler in her, in her lengthy opinion, ruled that the Justice Department found the tobacco industry defendants liable for violating a RICO, a Racketeering Influence Corruption Organization Act. And that over the last 50 years, the tobacco industry lied, misrepresented and deceived the American public. This is so important because they marketed to every vulnerable population in America and they got away with it for half a century. 90% of the people who started smoking were below the age of 20. They focused extraordinary attention on youth. So when we start talking about stigma and all this other stuff, it's not stigma. They were they were violated by the tobacco industry and they were oppressed and they never had a chance. And every third smoker that started in youth was a smoker for life. So this is, this is an extraordinary time in our history. Now, there was no decision for financial compensation by the tobacco industry at that time because they didn't think they could do anything about making, you know, modifying the injury caused by the tobacco use. Now, fast forward, this is, this is CDC data from a few, a few uh, you know, about the same time. And so from the time where the data I showed you in 64, where heart disease is the leading cause of death, you can see on this pie chart that heart disease still was, um, if you combined with, with stroke. And lung cancer there was associated with 123,000 deaths. And COPD, chronic lung disease, emphysema, kind of went from 5% back in 63 to actually a much higher percentage here. So there's been dynamic changes 
but the first three causes of premature tobacco mortality have stayed the same. They're very similar to a presentation that some gentleman from the Netherlands just gave in terms of their, their current study, the big three. Now, I'm really enjoying this. Um, so I just talked about the numbers. Even in, and this is data from, um, you know, 2005 to 2012. And, and this is actually from the Surgeon General's report of 2014. 42 million people still smoking in 2014. The economic cost, now this is the United States only, but there's comparable stories to be told at every nation across the world in this regard. We have, you know, more, more definitive numbers. And here, the smoking attributable economic cost was on the order of, of you know, $300 billion, including, you know, three, 130 to 175 billion of direct medical care. And this is for a disease that they basically said, you know, the tobacco industry were criminal in their behavior. Fast forward, this is an analysis done by the Gates Foundation with the NIH. And I just wanna show you one thing here. Ischemic heart disease still overwhelmingly, number one, lung cancer, number two. COPD from 1990 to 2016 went and increased uh, frequency uh, by close to, uh, the change is, is close to 70%. And so COPD has become a much more important chronic cause of premature death. So collectively, these three diseases account for 44% of all mortality of the top 25 causes of premature death in our society. And these are the three diseases that you've been hearing over the course of the last couple of days that we can now readily visualize on thoracic CT. Okay. Now, all of what's happening is not hopeless. We now have in the United States over 46 million former smokers. And the modeling activity, the CISNET modeling activity of the National Institutes of Health, one of the most important works they did was to try to get a handle on how smoking cessation affected the health of the nation. And here's their data. And this is on the NIH sites. And basically, smoking cessation has been associated with well over a million saved lives. So, I mean, this is real. No one knows about this, but over a million people have benefited from smoking cessation since the, the Surgeon General's report. Now, we've already heard about this. I'm not gonna spend much time, but in New York, and this is uh, Emmanuel Casaboli and um, uh, Raja Flores published this with the ILCAP group. And they're finding now that stage one detection is measurable in large populations. This is the stage shift we are waiting for. And I show this because lung cancer screening is working. It's doing what we said it would do. It's, it's, it also has comparable data from the University of Pennsylvania. And we have the brilliant work of the Taiwanese and what they've shown a stage shift published in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology. So this is a very important thing that's happening. Um, Tony Reese couldn't make it. I think he, he, he's still waiting in the airport somewhere, but he's shown over the last 20 years, you could get all kinds of additional information from the thoracic CT evaluation. Others have done the same thing. The brilliant work of the Nelson Group has, has been very, very important. And others in this room have contributed as well. We tried to say, okay, let's just take a baby step. Let's just say that we do something about lung cancer screening and, and emphysema. And this is a paper that took us well over a year to publish. And the basis of the paper was a publication from ILCAP and a publication from the NLST basically showed that just under 80,000 people who were screened had frequency of some degree of emphysema between 23 and 30%. Numbers are bouncing around in the literature, but something on the, on the order of close to one in three have an early change of emphysema. The rest of this basically says that it's not just the old symptomatic short of breath COPD, 
it's early emphysema. 85% of these people didn't know they had anything. So what the world says, a world of editors say is, okay, what are you going to do about it? We shouldn't tell them if we can't do anything about it. Well, we got to tell them because we know from multiple publications, including from my LCAP, that if you have some degree of emphysema, your risk of getting lung cancer is higher, statistically higher. And it's been pu published by multiple groups. So we got to tell you, because right now, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force doesn't say anything about the findings of emphysema or coronary disease in the context of screening, even though it happens in tens of thousands of people now. So we've got to do more research on what we should do about that. And we, we have two options, pharmacological interventions, and that's a long story, and non-pharmacologic interventions, which is a very important story because things like vaccines, vaccinations, just standard vaccinations in a emphysema population are much more impactful than in the general population. Other preventive measures, smoking cessation and physical exercise are very important. And we don't believe in doing stuff that doesn't cost anything. And, and, and we have to re reframe that kind of perspective. Um, Bruce Pyanson, who might be in this audience, yes, he is, recently published with a group from Jerry Kreiner, a very noted pulmonologist, that one of the new triple drug therapies for emphysema can be used. And if they, if they extrapolate from the known numbers, they can have an impact that's outlined here. So potentially over the course of 10 years, they could reduce hospitalizations by 2 million. Most people don't look at time in the hospital as kind of good. The next thing they could do is potentially expand if they gave this drug to a target population, they could expand life expectancy by 2.2 years. That's an enormous number. And it's one drug and it's well tolerated. So there are pharmacologic things to do. And that's another long discussion. Cardiovascular disease, there's a very parallel story. I was assuming that Dr. Nagavi was gonna to talk to us about that because his work and the work that we've heard from uh, the, the Nelson and others is going to revolutionize perceptions of screening because you can now visualize the three leading causes of death with a service that is paid for already by, you know, um, in, in target populations. And we, we need to get the details correct and the technical stuff we've been talking about is essential. But what other tests can give you this kind of strategically valuable information? Um, there are concerns. Uh, one of the things here, is from an uh, article that said, basically, some of our vulnerable populations don't feel good about things like AI and are not likely to share their data with AI developers. And in that case, we might make tools that work for certain populations that don't work so well in other populations. So we have to you know, build in a sensitivity to equity on these public health measures from the ground floor up. We have tools, this is infrastructure, Rick developed with the ISLC to uh, disseminate this information globally. So we can potentially couple these images together and do much more rapid AI development and other tool development. And so I'll conclude here. This is happening now, it's important, it's unprecedented. And what you're doing each day in your home institution is just critical for the, the well-being of our civilization for the remainder of the century. Thank you.